So uh, yesterday night, I, uh, th that's the first time, it's so weird. Uh, I came across a bump, I was thinking for one hour and I couldn't think of a sermon. So, uh, so I have no sermon today. I'm going to go just through simply. Uh, I'm just gonna go by how the Lord moves. Uh, maybe the Lord has something uh, because of what we experienced here right now. Maybe the Lord wants to uh, teach you or maybe there's something I can give to you. Uh, it, it's, it's going to be a simple sermon. I don't think that I'm going to take too long on this one. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter eight and then I want us to start off with verse 12. Verse 12, so we'll go through here. Let's start off with verse 10, verse 10. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full, and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein. And when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Uh, if we see the passage over here that the Bible points out where the children of Israel, they've, uh, if they enter into the land of Canaan, God fears that when they become full, when they become truly blessed, then they're going to forget the Lord and they're going to forget all the good things that he's done for them. Let me see here. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So uh, the children of Israel, you can imagine the excitement that they had as they were trying to enter into the promised land of Canaan. As they were trying to enter into the promised land of Canaan, you can imagine the joy. They've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, and they had no home, no place to stay. And then God says, now you're about to enter into the promised land. But he fears that they will forget their beginnings, where they come from. And God fears that in the future that they will become full and so blessed by him that the people will forget God. And they will claim that this is their own doing and their own taking. I want to tell this church that we've wandered for a very, very long time. And we stood strong together. And we held on. And we tried to stick together and to keep on going. Uh, we went through trials. We went through good times and bad times. But our spirits were strengthened. And uh, our spiritual nature... And then our growth become even bonded much, much closer. While we were wandering all this time, the Lord strengthened us. And now he is giving us the promised land. And now that we are in the promised land, we are excited and we are happy. But God does not want us to forget our beginnings. And I hope that you will not forget your beginnings where you came from. Do you remember the time where... You needed God and no one was there to help you out. And then he filled in that need for you. Do you remember that time when we were, uh, when the church felt like that it was falling apart and we were hanging in by the threads? The Lord, he pulled us through. Do you remember all the times when we thought that there would be losses and the enemy suddenly attacked? That the Lord gave us a victory the next couple of days. Amen. What seemed to be impossible, what seemed to be a loss, turned out to be a victory and a miracle in the end. Amen. Don't ever forget where we came from. Yeah. Don't ever forget what we went through. And don't forget what God pulled you through. And don't forget who is the one we should be thinking about. And it's not a new place. And it's not new people. And it's not a better ministry or a new beginning. It's God. Amen. As we start something together, a new chapter, we have to think about God Amen. in all of this. Is God the center of attention in your mind? Or is it where it's a temporary fleshly joy rather than gratitude and thankfulness for what God pulled you through and what he's given to you? Uh, Y'all pray along with me. Father God, uh, I'm just... Uh, I'm just going to preach, Lord. This is so simple, and 
It's not going to be something big or fancy, and maybe it won't be that convicting. But I pray that uh, you, use this, you use simple messages and you use big messages. You'll use any message for your glory and for your honor. Will you fill me? Fill me and use me, Father, and help me to preach what you want me to preach and help it to help, uh, help out the people today. I, I have absolutely nothing today, Lord. I'm just going to just simply preach your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. On, now, uh, I want you to turn to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus. We're going to look at the book of Exodus and then chapter 14. We're going to look at Exodus chapter 14. Now notice that when God takes the children of Israel out from the land of bondage, that he's going to uh, pull them through the Red Sea. If we look at verse 1 through 2, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pehahiroth, between Migdol and the sea, over against Baal Zephon, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. So notice that the Lord, he's bringing the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and they're about to go through the Red Sea, and Pharaoh's trying to chase after them. But beforehand, the people, they were nevertheless excited. They didn't think about Pharaoh or the army or the enemies. They were just excited that they were free from the land of bondage and they were able to enter into the land of Canaan. If we look at verse 17, uh, verse 17, and it came to uh, chapter 13, excuse me, chapter 13, verse 17, chapter 13 and verse 17. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn, the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. And they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. The children of Israel... Uh, God didn't put them through the land of the Philistines, you'll notice at verse 17, but took them to a different route. Why is that? Because then the people would be discouraged. And I want you to understand that the Lord, when he begins a new chapter in your life, there may be new challenges and new fears, but the Lord, he understands your limits, you must understand. Yes, it is true that you should be brave for the Lord and you should be strong and it is your fault and your part. But you'd be surprised how the Lord, how merciful he will be. And in verse 17 through 18, he'll take you to a different direction, a different route because he knows your limits. As the Jews, they've been freed from the land of bondage. God has been merciful to them that I understand that you're still weak. Yes, you rejoice. Yes, you're happy. Yes, you're free from bondage. And you have this gung-ho attitude. Let's go and conquer the land. But I know your limits. I know that you're still weak. And I know that you're still frail. And you're you're still sinful in flesh. And you know what I'm going to do with you? You should get right with God. You should get right with me. But I can be very merciful. I'll take you to a different route. And that way you can conquer the land of Canaan together. You have to understand that when God gives you something new or a big blessing in life, there's huge responsibility, but there's also a lot of mercy. And there's nothing to fear when we start a new chapter in life. We should be happy like the Jews. You can imagine the Jews in their mind that, oh, as soon as one of the Jews wakes up in the morning and that Jew says, oh man, I got to get to work. And then because he's so used to the habit of waking up five in the morning, he's like, Wait a minute, I got no work today. I've I've been so used to going into the mud pits and then just serving my Egyptian taskmasters and being in bondage and I kept getting hurt by them. And this is such a weird feeling. 
wow, this feels great. And then he gets to wake up in the morning feeling fresh and free. No longer the chains around his wrists and no longer the beating of the taskmasters on his back. But now that he can enter the promised land, he's so excited. What's my new home going to be look like? I can't wait to live in my new property. It's going to be so beautiful when I live with my family and settle over here. And as these Jews get excited, the Lord knows ahead of time that they're fleshly, that they're weak, and they're sinful. And yeah, God knows that they're going to complain later on. And God knows because he sees the future that they're going to let him down. And they're going to complain and that they would build up a golden calf and sin against him. But you know what God says? God says that let him shout a little bit. Let him be happy. Let him rejoice for what he's going to have. I know that he's going to sin tomorrow and sin in the future and let me down. Even when I put him to a new situation and a new place where he can glorify me. But you know what? Let him enjoy. Let him give me the praise. Let him have his blowout and let him just shout and let him just enjoy fellowship. Let him be happy and just let him just, uh, just rejoice and have a good time. Amen. Well, what if something bad happens to me in the future? God's got your back. He knows your limits. Amen. And yeah, you should be stronger in the Lord, but God knows your limits. And sometimes he'll give that little detour. Amen. There's nothing to fear about a new chapter in life, but rather to be happy. Why not be happy? Why not accept it and be excited and, and be grateful and say, Lord, thank you so much for uh, this place and this situation that you put me in, and a new chapter, and then just, just start to enjoy. You might say, well, what if I mess up in the future? What if something bad happens to me? Hey, God already knows all of that in the future. And God is not paying attention to those things. Instead, he's looking at, hey, I want my child to enjoy what he or she has right now. If God can do that, why can't you do that as well? Why can't you concentrate on the now, what you have in the Lord, and be thankful? And then as we start something new and exciting, don't fear about tomorrow, but to enjoy what you have now. Enjoy what you have now. It's exciting. Entering the promised land. Partaking in its fruits. Partaking in its sweetness. And to just get a clean river to dunk your face in. And man, it's such beautiful meadows and green hills. And we can just run around and joy. Just be there and singing dwelling in Beulah land. Singing camping in Canaan's happy land. Singing marching to Zion. Let's just enjoy what we have and not fear about the liberal community. Not fear about the challenges ahead. And not think about the wrath of the devil. And not think about what church splits we might go through in the future. And not think about our possible sins we might commit. Why don't we rejoice right now what we have and say, Thank you, Lord, for what you blessed me and what you've given to me. And I'm just going to sit down and enjoy life. Be before I work, before I struggle, before I cry the next week, let me laugh and enjoy life today. Why don't you just enjoy what you have right now? Amen. Let me tell you something. You want to cry about tomorrow? Guess what? That's, you think that if you get tomorrow over, if you get the victory over tomorrow, that's it? You think that, oh, well, if God took care of this problem and situation for me, oh, then you think you're done after that? What if, uh, what if you thought about every problem you're going to go through and God showed that to you right now? Do you know how overwhelming that would be? All of us would slit our wrists probably by now if God showed it all to us. Why? Because you're like, I don't want to go through that. I don't want to go through that pain. Oh, that's horrible. That is so horrible, isn't it, to think about all those things? So why are you worried about this one single thing? You got a lot more up ahead. Yeah, that's good, brother. But obviously it's not common sense in life to live that way, to think about every single problem in life, then no one's happy. And I'm talking about just lost people without Jesus Christ. No one can live life that way. Everybody, lost or saved, knows that even if you deal with this problem, this situation you're going through in your family or in the church or in your job or in your own health, that uh, that's not the only problem. You're not going to be happy. There's going to be this problem, this problem, these other problems. Yeah. Ten million other problems. That's true. And if every lost person knew about all their ten million problems in the future, they'd fear life and they just want to quit and run away. 
and take their own life away and say it's a miserable world. But see, that's not how the lost world lives. They live basically one day at a time. Right. I mean, don't, sometimes Christians should have better sense, don't they? Why not live one day at a time with what God has given to you and to enjoy and to be happy with what God has given to you? If the lost world can do that, they, you got to realize this. They drink, they smoke, they dance, they live like the world. They try to live prosperously in their jobs, their homes and their places and everything. And guess what? They still go through 10 million pains tomorrow but they don't care and they party away and they enjoy life and they're going to die and burn in hell for eternity and scream their lungs out for all of eternity burning in hell. But guess what? Let me drink and dance and enjoy life now. Wow, lost people can do that. Why don't you, why can't you enjoy life what God has given to you and then you got all eternity to continue your joy. As we conquer a new land and a new chapter, let us be excited for what we have now. But what the devil is going to do is that he's going to steal that joy and he's going to make you too comfortable. I want you to go to Deuteronomy 4 again. Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. <clears throat> uh, Deuteronomy 8, excuse me, Deuteronomy 8. That's where we read. Now look what... God says here about the Jews, the danger with these Jews when they enter the land of Canaan, that God says at verse 10, Deuteronomy 8, 10, when thou hast eaten and art full. Look at verse 11, beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments. Then what happens, verse 14, then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God. Look at verse 17, and thou say in thine heart, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. Verse 18, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. Now, the danger is that when these Jews are so excited and so happy and they're enjoying what God has given to them, the danger with these people is two things. One, they get lost in that joy. And when they get so lost in that joy, God is not in their minds. Instead, they're thinking about, man, a new job. Man, a new building. Man, a new life. Man, a new worldly thing and this and this and this. And they, God is not on their minds. Now some of you will say, praise the Lord or thank you, Lord, or thank God for this. But then, you know, you're just saying that because it's a habit. Your heart's not really into it. God is not the center of attention in your mind. If God is the center of attention in your mind, you know what would have happened? What would have happened is you would not have stayed too comfortable in the blessing and then let the blessing overrun your flesh to where, well, you know, I'm enjoying this so much so I don't have to come to church anymore. You know, it's uh, hard to read my Bible because now it's easy where God dropped the hours of my job where I can sleep longer and enjoy life more. Why not do that? You know, God rescued me from this family crisis where it was going to split in half. But, you know, the past 20 years, it's been going really well. Why don't I live, live it up a little and be a little rebellious or be the little troublemaker in my family? You'll, you see that with the next generations, right? Too comfortable, get handed out, and then what? They take it for granted. That's it. That's it. And then it ruins the home. Do you know how we ended up with this mess right now with our current uh, restrictions and everything bad going on? Do you know how? We can blame globalist elites or people in power and stuff like that, but you got to realize this, is that those people cannot be in power unless there's a system that gives them that power. You might say, what's the system that gives them that power? A system that gives them that power is the people. And these people produce a power, and then those who are in charge, those who want to take advantage of the public and these people, have to know what is the consumer's desire right here. 
Isn't that how some people become billionaires? They meet up the consumer's interests and desires first. You know why we get all this kind of medical issues so far with candy here and candy there? For some of you know what candy means. Okay. So why is it that we got all these issues with the candies right now? Because we live now to a day and age uh, why aren't people talking about it or critiquing it, especially those who major in such a profession like that in those fields? The reason why is because a system is built now. A system is built where it's so large and so big because the people who said, I want something quick and clean to, and some kind of solution or medicine to just get rid of this issue. And then they just pay the money because they already have the money. It's given out to them. And they already have a healthcare system that's already given out to them. And they feed that beast. And because they keep feeding that beast, now we live to the point where professions and uh, people who major in these fields, who suggest you some, certain types of treatment and all that, they're so used to this robotic phase of, okay, next one, it's a client. Next one, it's a client. Doc, uh, doctors have a big problem with that in hospitals that they, some of them actually take acting lessons and acting classes. You know that? Because they're so used to treating so much blood and so much people and it's so busy that you, you, you get used to it. What happened? Because of people who fed that beast, that monster. I want a quick one, a quick solution. They don't want to take time to take care of their own health. They don't want to take time to watch their own diet. Why do you think cancer is one of the world's leading cause of death? See, your fault. You got too comfortable. You got too comfortable and look, I have money that's cheap and I can buy cheap food and it tastes good. So let me live up life that way. And you get too comfortable in it and you feed that system and that beast. Then those people in charge feeding you or giving you those products, what do they want to do? They want to get rich. They want to get powerful. They want to control you. How are they going to do that? They're going to have to keep feeding you, feeding your lust, feeding the consumer what you want. That's why this whole system's messed up. Right. It's more so of not of, it's, it's, you know what I realize? It's, it's more so of not, it doesn't go more so on the devil or his minions or the powers that be in charge. It's more of you. You're the problem. Why? Because those people can't take charge unless there's a system. You created that system. The devil can't go against God's commission and uh, permission and force you to do something bad. He has to see what your interests are, what your desires are, what your consumer spirit is, and he's going to keep feeding it to you. Then he's going to control you. Give me proof of that. Very first temptation. Why? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life with Eve. She saw the fruit that was pleasant to the eyes. Tree to desire to make one wise, something to eat. That's how people can take charge of your life. Evil people can control your life and you become a puppet. They just keep feeding the puppet. And it'll do whatever it wants. You're that doggy, you know. Sit, and here's a, here's a, here's a treat. Sit, sit, good doggy, and then you just feed the treat. Because it's not a problem for the devil. He owns the whole world. Yeah. He just feeds you. It's not a problem for him. And that's some of you right now. You're just feeding the beast. What's your point, preacher? Don't create this into a machine system. You know what? People have not learned from history. You've heard this. It's a famous thing from Dr. Upman about man movement, and then it talks about one Part of the list is machine. Starts out with people, then becomes a movement, then we get excited, we serve the Lord, but then it'll turn into a machine one day. And it'll become a machine that, God forbid, that you'll just walk through those doors right there and think it's a typical Sunday and that just following security protocol, just following the kitchen rules and don't bring this over here and then just put on your Sunday best and, yeah, just shout when I feel like it's the time to shout and then, you know, just say amen and then, you know, just play the piano because it's just given over there and then just uh, come on the altar because it's given right there and then the place that we have, you know, it should keep us warm it should keep out the rain but then see we take it as it should it should because you got too comfortable and you created a system of a beast that you become programmed in 
And that's what you see in 99% of churches right now. Because 99% of churches have better buildings, systems, operation than us. And people, when you go to those churches, they're deader than a doornail and they're miserable, they're sad, and they complain. That's what happened to the Jews. You know what you don't want to do? You don't want to create a machine. Don't feed this. Well, how am I going to do it then, Pastor? That you, if you thought about God, you wouldn't have. You just kept looking at fleshly things over here. and Oh, oh, I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad. And God was not on your mind. But if God was on your mind, you would remember that he's the one who gives you good things. And then when bad things happen in your life and the fleshly desire wears out because you're so used to it and you're comfortable, if God was always on your mind, you would say, Lord, get me right with you. Lord, I know that true happiness is found in you. I have to take it by faith no matter how my flesh feels. And my flesh might feel miserable and rotten and complaining and whining. I have to take that invisible hand by faith and just grab it midair. And I can't see it and I can't feel it, but just believe you're there and you're a good God and I can still taste good things from you. Do you do that? No, your problem is... Christian is you're too fleshly you need to see you need to feel and that's that program and the devil has to hit those feeling good buttons those like buttons in your body and if he keeps pressing that you're going to be programmed to keep following that don't turn this into a machine a mindless beast Never do that. When you, have, when you taste the good things in life, remember God. Remember God. Amen. And it's all about Him. Amen. Remember it's about Him and not you. Because if you put about you and what's my happiness, what I want in life, then that's what the devil thinks. He's like, okay, what makes him or her happy in this world, right? You don't think he knows? Oh, you know, 24-7, you go around. He, he got his minions and everybody, they can see 24-7. They know, oh, this is what makes him or her happy in this world. Okay, just write this down. And then they have a plan. And now they have a plan set up where, okay, now we can control. Let's play with this puppet and see what it will do. And the puppet will go to a mindless machine and follow whatever the system gives. That's what it creates into. And those who are so evil and those who want to take advantage of your life, all they have to do is just side in with the devil. And they're the ones who can play the master as well. And you're the puppets on their strings. That's all they have to do. And you're just mindless robots following that system. Or you remember God. And you remember God. And when you have God in your mind, God's going to keep your eyes and understanding open and aware like, wait a minute, wake up. Am I in a machine right now? Am I in the matrix right now? And when your eyes are always set on Jesus Christ and what he wants in your life, any fleshly thing that the devil does to program you, you're going to catch it. And you're going to go, wait a minute, that contradicts the word of God. That contradicts what I learn as a Bible believer. And I know what this is. And you're going to reject that like button from the devil when he kept, keeps pressing that in your flesh. And you're going to go, no flesh, no flesh. Because why? Because I remember God. Amen. Amen. And God is number one and should be on your mind. Amen. If you remember God, isn't God the one who gives you the good things? Then you get the good things. But you look at good things first, not God. Mm, that's good. You know what your problem is? You look at good things first, then you think about God. Oh, thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you, Lord, for that. Praise the Lord for this. Your problem is you look at good things first. See, you're a robot. You're programmed. It's a fleshly thing. You know what? You should be looking at God first. And when you look at God first, what happens when the good things come? You thank him more. You honor him more. You worship him more. You pledge your allegiance even further for him. But some of you, no matter how much, it's, you know what's so sad? How much God blesses your life, you still did not pledge your allegiance yet to him. 
You still put good things first and then God, didn't you, all this time? God forbid that's the reason why you're still serving God is because only the good things he gave to you. You're that robot. Because that ain't a problem for the devil to do with you. You should be God first. God first. But how can I do that? Faith. 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 It's just believing. But you don't believe. Look at Hebrews 11. We studied this this morning, didn't we? Look at Hebrews 11. It's something invisible. You cannot see it. It's not like drawn out for you. It's not something that's articulated or preached that clearly. It's not something dramatic that stirs your emotions. It's just invisible moments where it's nothing but thin air and you're feeling, and what you're sensing is misery. What you're seeing is sadness. And then what you're thinking about is gloominess. And then there's nothing to grab on because there's nothing out there the Lord can give you to grab on. And that's called faith. It's just invisible. Just leap and grab it Amen. and say, God, this is what you said I believe. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, what? Not knowing whither he went. He didn't know about God's promise or that good thing. He never got it. He never see, seen it. He never tasted it. He never imagined it. He just lost his father who just died and his homeland. And God just told him, get out of there. Sacrifice your family for me. And I'll give you the good things. Did he see that? No. Did he taste that? No. Did he experience that? No. What did he do? Just invisible. With that grief of his father passing away. And the attachment drawn to his family. He says, okay. And then he grabs God's hand by faith and says, I'll believe that you're going to give me the good thing. Can you do that? Do you have that? If you don't have that, that's why you're still a robot right now. You're a robot program sitting in that pew right now listening to me because it's proper and it's courteous and that you're just programmed that I've got to wake up eight or seven or six in the morning so that I can come here to church and you're that robot where there's something that goes on the service that hits, presses your like buttons in your flesh and then you feel good. There's something in this church that you saw that made you more happy and all the devil has to do is keep feeding that system and then one day you get lost in that system yeah. that there's no way you can get out of that monster. And one day there's going to be some elitist or somebody in charge who's going to take advantage of your system and abuse and ruin your life. Is that you? Do you have a family member treating you like that right now? Do you have a friend treating you like that? Uh, uh, treating you that way right now? Your workplace? Some of you don't know you're programmed already. You just, uh, I guarantee 90% of the people here are already programmed. Like that. You might say, who are they abused by? Who are they taking advantage of? University not too far away. They pull the strings to everything here. Why is that? Oh, what they got brainwashed, what they studied, what they learned. And then they thought that they're independent and they're free. It's so amazing as, as they... Keep putting rules so that they can control your life. People think more and more, democracy. This is democracy. This is democracy. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Totally brainwashed. You know why? They got lost in a system. Yeah. And those evil leaders saw that system and they took advantage of it. And that's how they control your life. You got someone kicking you in the rear end right now, abusing you, and you're their lapdog. You got somebody. Are you that lapdog? Are you that mindless slave? How do I get free from that? Where's that hand of God that you grabbed? You never went out by faith and grabbed his hand. No, you went by some master that gives you good things. And you'll do whatever that master says. It's called money. It's called lust. It's called experience. It's called feelings. It's called my friend. It's my husband. It's my wife. It's my children. It's religion. It's church. You're a mindless slave. Why are you here today? 
Why are you here today? There's something that I pressed your like button and you liked and you came. I can preach a very hard negative preaching, you know that? That'll make people feel bad, but for you, it presses your like button. And that's why you come to church. I can preach, uh, what, what if I don't preach something that really convicts you or hits you really hard? You're going to still come to church? Why do you come to church? Remember God. Amen. Amen. You forgot God, didn't you? You forgot God. How many of you today are guilty where you rejoice in the Lord and you're happy what he's blessed you with, but you, but you actually forgot him? Did you forget God? Don't forget him. Don't forget him. He's the true master who really cares about you. I don't, I, he don't really care about me. Why do the, all these bad things happen? Because then he'll be that evil leader. All he has to do is keep feeding what you like in your flesh and then take advantage of your life. You're never free that way. You're a mindless robot stuck in a system. That's what happens. How do I know God really cares about me? Simple, it's called free will. Free choice. And when he gives you free choice, he gives you that choice to break free from that system and follow him. Amen. No matter how much it goes against your like buttons in your flesh. And then he gives you a choice. You can go by your flesh right. and, let, and let it keep hitting your like buttons and be programmed to that. What did mankind choose? This. What they desire. A system. What's their system? Do you know the fruits of this system that you fall into? It's death. What's the fruit of this system? Hell. What's the fruit of this system? More heartbreaks. What's the fruit of this system? Misery. What's the fruit of this system? Discontentment. What's the fruit of this, uh, what's the fruit of this system? Weakness. What's the fruit of this system? Discontentment. What's the fruit of this system? The devil. He controls you. Go to Romans 5. Romans 5. If God really loved me and cared for me, then he'd have me serve him to where it, it hits my like bu buttons and make me serve him and stuff like that. When you do that, then you get rid of what God truly loves you and really cares for you by giving you free will. He gives you free will to truly prove that I have nothing to do with it. Yeah. You made the decision. How so? He's going to show you that, hey, it's not something where I did something where I've warmed your heart and made you serve me. Like a lot of television does, right? Television does that. Warms your heart, makes you cry when some fake news reporter or some fake leader in the government just cries, I care about you. Why don't you understand that our democracy is falling apart? You know, it just makes you stinking angry. That's the opposite feeling I have with this brainwashed system that you see in TV nowadays and on the internet. But you know what? People fall for that, don't they? Yeah. And whatever garbage propaganda that Hollywood movies point out, that's why they accept their liberal ideology. God at least has that much decency and courtesy and respect to say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be that brainwashing tool. Crazy. Let, me, let me prove to you, let me prove to you that you have free choice and you can make the decision without me influencing you. Ready for this? Abraham, you took it by faith. Yes, Lord, I did that. Sacrifice your only begotten son on the altar. Now that's proof right there that God's not going to influence or control him. He put him at an ultimate situation where I'm going to prove to you that I had no influence to you whatsoever. You can make that choice to go against the feelings of your flesh, what your program. You can make that choice to do it yourself and sacrifice your son. Or you can choose to follow the feelings of your flesh and then I go along with that, says God, and then you're never really free. That's why he lets trial happen. He lets trial happen.
to really prove free choice and that he has truly no hand upon that to influence you. It's all your accountability, your responsibility. Romans chapter 5, the Bible says in verse 3, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. See, the Holy Ghost, He can make you, uh, make the hope spread abroad your heart. Some of you have that feeling of hope, and no matter what trial or pain you go through, you have that positive spirit for some weird reason. That thankful spirit, that joyous spirit, and hope and faith was invisible before, but now it's been confirmed. You saw something that confirmed it. And God proved it to you time and time again. So then you've been strengthened in your faith. But how you get such a mature ending and that hope is not, it's not just handed out to you. The Holy Spirit gives it. Pastor, at verse 5, the Holy Spirit gives it. Yeah, but it comes through, verse 3, tribulation first. It comes through tribulation first. You might say, why is that? Because when you go through hard times and pain, and I don't know how many of you are going through hard times and pain right now, and the devil's trying to steal, steal your joy, but you got to remember this. That's what the children of Israel's problem was when they forgot the Lord. They concentrated on any pain out there, even if it's small and not major. They looked at that. And because they looked at that small pain, right when they were entered about to enter the promised land, right when they were about to enter that final phase and blessing, they let that little pain get to them. Wow. And God says, fine, don't enter the promised land. That's what you wanted. Wow. It were better to die out in the wilderness, they said. And God said, okay, if that's what you want, die out in the wilderness. Wow. Then they run like a lap dog and they cry and say, no, we're ready to go in the promised land. How about that? You know what that is? That's you right now. That's some of you right now is that when God blesses you and gives you a promised land, trust me, when you get too comfortable in that and get lost in that system, you're going to find any pain out there. You're going to find any pain out there to whine about. It's like as if you're searching for something uncomfortable to cry about to God. Rather than looking at the billion blessings that you got in your home, even with all this crummy stuff going on right now in this year, you got a billion things to shout about and a billion things to be thankful for. Billion things that God has not taken away. A billion things that still love you. People who care. And you got all these things. And you just reject all of that. And you concentrate on any pain out there. And God's like, fine, you don't want all those things? Then let me have it back. You're ungrateful. Let me have it back, God says. So God understands that dark system so he's a great god he's such a great god that he understands you got to believe him on this that's your problem you don't believe him he knows your limits even the time when you sin and you should get right he understands the limit of yours and will let you go you don't believe that he knows your limit so then because he knows your limit he gives you the blessing to enjoy. He doesn't look down on you. Like some of you would feel when you come to this church and hear the preaching, you feel looked down on. Because some people here are more spiritual than you and the preacher is probably more spiritual than you. And we're nice, we're kind, and we're trying to show love. But yet somehow in your unconscious mind, you feel looked down upon. Let me tell you something. God really don't do it that way. Because he already knows your limits. We don't. But God knows. Amen. So God's not looking down on you. He knows your limits. So if he really knows your limits, well, you should do better. You should do better. No, no, God's like, no, I know your limit. So when I give you this blessing, I want you to enjoy it. Oh, I feel guilty because of my limits. No, God understands your limit. Just enjoy it. Enjoy it. Yes. Because he will balance it out where you don't get lost in this system. Yeah. Yeah. And he will give you tribulation. And he will give you tribulation so that you don't get lost in this dark system. So you can truly remain free. Amen. Free and free. And don't get 
become a mindless slave. I'm afraid to be too comfortable, pastor. Don't be afraid. Get comfortable with what God has given to you. Yeah. And when God makes you uncomfortable, he will. And then you just take that discomfort. And then God will balance you out. And when he balances you out with that tribulation, you know what happens. Why is it that I can preach such hope to you today? I can't preach like this until I went through tribulation first. How can I preach like this to you today? Because I went through tribulation first. What happens in tribulation? It's not hope immediately at verse 3. It's what? Patience. Verse 3 says patience. I'm not feeling that hope. I'm not seeing that blessing that God promised to me. You're looking way ahead. You're still walking by faith, right? Like Abraham. That's what you got to do. You didn't slay Isaac on the altar yet, even though you think so. You're not there yet. Can you imagine every step closer, Abraham goes close on the altar? God did not send a blessing. God did not give him some understanding or some hope. It was tribulation and he had to grit his teeth and go by faith and say, God, I believe no matter what bad thing happens, I believe you're going to resurrect my son Isaac. And then he just went by faith. That's what patience is, is when you go through pain. It's not feeling good. It's not hope. It's not a uh, blessing. What did you think when you go through pain and you raise your hand? I have a prayer request. Will you please pray for me through this pain? Did you expect God to give you hope immediately like that? You expected God to intervene and send that miracle the next day or by the next week or you know, Lord, I can hold on till, till what? Your expected timetable or God's expected timetable? You know what that's called? Patience. Of course it's gritting teeth in pain. Of course it's going through sleepless nights and misery. That's what it's supposed to be. You might say, why would God do that? Because that's when verse 4, and patience experience. Why? Because experiences, I already went through that. I already experienced that. I already experienced that. I already went through that. So I repeated that. That way you can understand. That pain is behind you. It's done. You already went through it. And you already experienced those miserable nights, those feelings of pain, and what you went through. But guess what? You matured and you realized this is what happens in life. And this is what happens in life. And guess what? I'm not really dead. Yes, there were horrible things and painful things I went through, but guess what? It's not that bad like I thought it would be. And I went through it. I survived, and guess what? God blessed me, and I saw that. I experienced his blessing. I had seen the miracle when he intervened in my pain. But it was always, always not what I expected. So I give up thinking about that, and I just go by faith invisibly and grab his hand and pull me through. Why should I do that? Because I already experienced that. I've seen God pull too many miracles on my life. So that's why it's, I can keep holding his hand by faith. Amen. That's how you get that uh, faith solidified and strengthened. Not at the beginning. It's at the end. It's after you experienced, experienced that patience and tribulation. What happens is this. This is a fleshly, biological, psychological thing too. After you experience something, your flesh and your brain and your body memorizes, remembers that. And because it remembers that, it remembers its uh, defense mechanisms and what it went through, so it gets used to it. Yeah. And when it gets used to it, it can keep going. Amen. You might say, no, it's hard to get used to it. See, you're lost in that comfortable system. When you get lost in a comfortable system of wearing uh, six, uh, six feet of cushion underneath your feet, guess what? You will feel that small little stone underneath your feet when you get lost in that system. But if your feet gets used to like, you know, just uh, like one, one millimeter, centimeter, I don't know how long this is, like between you and the floor and your foot just gets used to that, what happens? It just gets used to it. It's normal and it doesn't really bother you. Why? Because you're used to that discomfort. You need that. Do you understand that? You need that. 
You can't reject it. You can't run away from that. No, you need it. It's for your good. Amen. Amen. If you stay lost in your comfort, you get lost into a blind slave oh, system yeah. and you will feel any little stone on your foot somewhere in that lost cushion. You will. Because that's what happened to the Jews. They found any discomfort out there. They were so spoiled that they said, better that I die in the wilderness. Be careful. God will give you what you want. That's why at the last part of verse 4, hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. What we see here today is hope. Why? Do you remember what we experienced last week, last two weeks, last couple months? Do you remember what we experienced? All the time we thought we would lose something. We got a victory. All the times it seems like the adversaries and the enemies would win. We, we overcome. Times we thought we would die and not survive. We survive by a thread. Yeah, amen. Things that we thought were, died and it's the end of the world, God resurrected back to life. Do you, re, do you remember what we experienced? Small little room. Two people takes one person to complain where you can lose half of a church. Wow. Where, you know, that, uh, you remember those times you were the only one out there trying to give the gospel? Do you remember what you experienced with every time we went through misery and pain together and we always wrote it down on a prayer list and we just kept saying empty, it felt empty like we're speaking to air and grabbing into something invisible. Do you remember that blind faith we had to do? And then God confirmed it. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Through. Amen. Amen. What's this? Hope. Yeah. Hope. Do you forget? Did you forget God That's and what you Thank experienced? You. Let's go backwards. Did you remember those times you grit your teeth in pain? Some of you still going through sleepless nights. Some of you still crying. Some of you feel like that you have to run away and you're facing some kind of traumatic thing. Some of you are probably going through a dispute or a fight and you're about to throw in the towel right now. Do you remember those times where you prayed and prayed and prayed and never got answered? You're not in hope yet. You're in patience. You're gritting your teeth. You're gritting your teeth. <clears throat> Let's go backwards. Are you in tribulation right now? What are, what's your tribulation right now? What do I do now? It's not hope. That solves your tribulation right now. It comes later. It's called faith. You remember God. You can choose to reject that. God gives you free choice. That proves he loves you more than the devil. Yes, sir. That proves he loves you more than your flesh. Yeah. That proves he loves you more than the world. Wow. That proves he loves you more than you love yourself. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. you know why? He knows your real good and what you truly need, and he will give it to you, and he will give you the freedom to bail out any time. But your flesh and your world and that devil won't let you go. And they'll do whatever it takes to get you lost in this comfort zone, That's this right. system. And you will be what God prophesied so 2,000 years ago. Church of Laodicea, you say you're rich and increased with good. And you don't know how miserable, poor, blind, and naked you are. Why, they got lost to a system. That's right. Comfortable. You can either choose to remember God today or get never think about it at all and just follow the system. Will you remember God with me today as we thank him for what he's given to us? Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. There is so much to thank him for. Let's, let's go back. Let's go back together and remember what we went through. Let's go back together and remember what we went through.
Do you remember those tribulations? Those times you grit your teeth in pain? What you experienced? And then what God has given the hope? Or have you got lost to such a comfortable system, you're still feeling that little stone underneath your foot and you're whining about it? Is that you today? Then God will give you what you want. God's like, fine, I'm done being good to you. Fine. Don't let that be you. Remember God. Do you remember? Go back. Oh, and in that lost mind of yours, you've been so lost in a system of comfort, chasing after every pleasure like a lap dog. You've been so lost to that comfortable system, you never thought about God. You don't remember how good he's been to you and what he's pulled you through. Will you thank God with me today? And let's not just say thank God for a new life, a new beginning. Let's thank him for who he is. Because if we thank him for what, who he really is, this new beginning, new life is just one of the benefits, a small thing lost in a sea of so many other innumerable benefits that make up God. Lord, I want to take time to thank you today. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I, even, I can even be, I can even act miserable and sad, but I can't, ha but I can't help but be lost in happiness. When I hear these people, their hearts are in it together. Lord, I, Lord, I, you're with us today. I never felt more united. May we not get lost to a sea of comfort. Instead, may we be so united because we remember the pain, what we've overcome. And that's why this blessing is even more sweet to taste, is it not, Father? If this was just given as a handout without what we experienced and the tribulations we grit through our teeth in pain, this would not be as united and not as sweet. Like 99% of churches right now who has everything in the world and they are not united. They're more divisive than ever before and they're complaining, they're whining, and they're not supportive. They still whine and cry, me, me, me. Help us to remember you. Lord, I thank you because of who you are. It's all the reason that I need to voice my praise. Because of who you are. Lord, I thank you because of who you are. It's all the reason that I need to voice my praise not because of the blessing, not because of the gold, not because of family, not because of good things, but because of who you are. Lord, you're such a great God. Thank you. Will you take time to thank him? He deserves every glory and every praise. Will you remember him and will you remember the pain with that. Will you remember what you experienced with him in that? Do you remember that time he held on to your invisible hand? Will you remember that with him today? It gives more gratitude for who he is and what he pulled you through. You know what you're feeling today, my friend? What you're feeling today? Hope. And it's not a comfort system. You know what you're feeling right now? Hope. Do you know why? Because of all that pain, we wander together for years and years, pitching a tent and cleaning up the tent and carrying the Ark of the Covenant and cleaning up the chairs and the tables and assembling the people and going through serpents, going through enemies who tried to raid us and how the devil tried to tempt us with this sin and split our camp. You, we remembered those 40 years we've wandered. 
And that's why hope is so sweet to taste right now. Father God, I'm going to close right now in prayer. Thank you for who you are. We're now camping in Canaan's land. May we not be that generation years later where the book of Judges says, as soon as they settled in Canaan for years, there arose a generation who forgot the Lord. May that not be our next generation now. Our children, Lord. Our children, Lord. Let that not be that generation. May they remember what their parents said. We walk by faith. We went under persecution. We sacrificed our money, our time together. May our next generation remember. May we remember. Even better than that, you can call us home right now and we'll forever remember your goodness and worship you for who you are. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.